My name is Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs here at the Milano School. And Milano is a division of the new school. It's our graduate school of management and urban policy. Um, I think what makes the school unique is it's about experiential learning. It's about um, learning about how policy not only is created, but how it's implemented in the field and how managers and policymakers work together to make change happen. Um, for those of you who are new to our events, I want to give you a little, other ba a little background about the center also and about the Child Welfare Watch. Um, the Center for New York City Affairs is an institute within the Milano School that's dedicated to advancing innovative public policies that strengthen neighborhoods, support families, and reduce urban poverty. And we run a number of applied policy research projects. One of them is Child Welfare Watch, which we publish about every six months or so um, jointly with the Center for an Urban Future. Uh, Center for an Urban Future is represented here today by Andy Breslau, who is the executive director. Wherever he went, he's here somewhere. Um, there he is, Andy. Um, the project is made possible thanks to grants from the Ira W. DeCamp Foundation, the Cyrus Fund, the Viola W. Bernard Foundation, and the Child Welfare Fund. So I want to thank them as well. Our investigative reporting, news, and analysis are meant to inform the human services sector as well as policymakers, legislators, and the news media. And the project seeks to establish more respectful and effective child and family policies to strengthen community-based supports for families, those provided by the public sector, as well as by private nonprofits. On the back cover of the report, which I hope you all picked up out on the table out there, are the names of our Child Welfare Watch Advisory Board. They're at the very core of this project. They don't have any control over the reporting, the editing, or the uh, articles themselves, but they do advise us on the topics that we explore. And the advisory board members work with us to draft the policy recommendations that, are, that appear at the beginning of, um, that appear on page three and four. Um, so the way this is structured is they're not responsible for the content of the report except for the policy recommendations. <laughs> so you can't blame them for that. That's our fault. They help to advance the recommendations in the field as well. So I very much want to thank our advisors for sharing their expertise and being such an important part of the project. And I know some of you are here, so th thanks to all of you. I also want to thank the several dozen people who gave us interviews and allowed us into their organizations and into their lives to do this project over the last several months. Among them are several young people who've been involved with the juvenile justice system. For the most part, we had to cloak their identities in the report because they're very young. And that's one of the most notable points in juvenile, about juvenile justice. We're talking about young teenagers here. And almost across the board, they come from working class and low income families. We're talking about kids primarily 15 years old and younger. Children growing up in poverty are by far the most likely young people to end up in family court on juvenile delinquency charges and the most likely to be sent to a state lockup to serve months in semi-secure detention before returning home. Often, as you'll read in the articles in, in this edition of The Watch, children in juvenile correctional facilities are also very likely to have been involved in the child welfare system. In fact, this past summer, the State Office of Children and Family Services reported that in one large cohort of teens locked up in state facilities back in the early first half of the 1990s, 46% of the boys and 65% of the girls came from, came from families that had previously received either child protective, preventive, or foster care services. That was a very different time. There were a lot more kids in foster care at that time. Um, there were certainly um, some major problems in communities at that time. Crack was still present. But that's nearly half the boys and nearly two-thirds of the girls from that cohort. And most practitioners in the field today say that's actually not so different from the situation now. I'm looking forward to seeing some research that updates those numbers. My point here is not new. The same families, the same children touch multiple government systems, often separately at discrete moments in their lives and usually amid a crisis. 
There's a report of child abuse or neglect. There's the loss of a home. There's an incident of domestic violence or a parent's emotional breakdown or a young teen drops out of school, breaks the law, and gets caught. And that's when government gets involved. Frequently, no one manages to identify and work with these families before the crisis becomes debilitating, before they lead to massive and often traumatic interventions or intervention after intervention after intervention. More than 12,550 times last year, that intervention came in the form of an, of an arrest of a young person younger than age 16. And about 5,900 times, the arrest led to the city pressing charges against a young person under age 16 in family court. Our report is about what happens after that point. We could have written a great deal about the city's pretrial detention system, and we may in the future. There's some fascinating things happening there. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased uh, that Commissioner Neil Hernandez is here from the Department of Juvenile Justice. But for now, we are focused on what happens to young people following the disposition of these cases in family court. I'm sure in the discussion we'll loop back to some of the other topics, but we wanted to keep this narrow, relatively so anyway. In recent years, there have been many important changes throughout the juvenile justice system. For one thing, the number of children under the age 16 admitted to state-run juvenile correctional facilities has dropped sharply from 1938 in the year 2001 to 813 in 2008. These are children who have been adjudicated in family court and sent by a judge, usually with the recommendation of the Department of Probation, to facilities run by the state's Office of Children and Family Services otherwise known as OCFS. This is the result of a number of changes in policy and practice. Even though the number of juvenile arrests in New York City has gone up in recent years, the city's diverting many more kids away from the courts entirely. A similar shift has been happening more recently in the post-disposition or post-sentencing phase of these cases. That's because, largely, there's a growing consensus that incarceration causes at least as much harm as good for juvenile delinquents, that locking up a child is as likely to exacerbate antisocial behavior as to foster rehabilitation. So family courts across the state are increasingly sending youths to alternative to placement programs, which offer close supervision and guidance to young people in their own communities. At least in the best of them, they also work with the families. At the same time, there's been a large increase in the number of juvenile delinquents placed in nonprofit run institutions, away from home, but where in most cases they have a bit more freedom and there is less of a correctional approach. For the most part, these are all significant changes, and many people in this room would say they're changes for the better. Yet as we write in this report, the state's juvenile correctional system clearly has not improved as much as it needs to in part because of some fundamental structural problems that have proven very difficult for reformers to overcome. For more than two years, Commissioner Gladys Carrion and her team at the state OCFS have worked towards reform. They've closed some correctional facilities and they've reduced the population of others. The agency sought to transform the culture of institutions from one based on custody and control to a therapeutic model that recognizes that trauma is often at the root of a young person's behavioral problems. And the progress has been significant. And yet, this past summer, the Federal Department of Justice released results of an investigation that found such poor conditions in four upstate facilities that they threatened federal intervention unless improvements were made soon. That Justice Department investigation of four facilities found that staff members regularly used excessive force to restrain, restrain children, resulting in broken teeth, broken bones, and concussions. At these same facilities, investigators found that mental health care was woefully inadequate. For example, children were given powerful psychotropic medications without proper monitoring to see if the drugs were effective or if they were causing side effects. Our own reporting in this, in this issue of the watch found that this lack of adequate mental health care pervades the OCFS system. Half the children housed in New York State's juvenile correctional facilities suffer from mental illness at least half, yet there's not one psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse on the staff of OCFS. In fact, mobile mental health teams are available only a few hours a week at each of these facilities. These doctors and nurses work for the State Office of Mental Health. Ironically, many of the children in these state lockups might have qualified for placement in a state mental health residential treatment facility, but there were either no beds available 
or the mental health facility refused to take kids with behavioral issues, or as we also found, many young teens are routinely shipped from the mental health facilities to the juvenile justice facilities because the mental health facilities can't cope with them or they decide they can't cope with them. So incarceration in New York is an unfortunate alternative to what should be a functioning mental health system for young people. Another part of the report looks at some of the alternative to placement programs which have grown substantially in recent years. These include programs that use evidence-based violence prevention programs to work intensively with young people who would otherwise have gone into a state correctional facility. But they also work with parents and families and the entire system in which a child lives to help strengthen the structure in their lives and help parents become authority figures capable of enforcing the rules. Remember, 80% of the teens in state juvenile correctional facilities and all of those in the alternative to placement programs are juvenile delinquents, not juvenile offenders. We'll talk about the distinction in the panel discussion. In other words, they were under the age of 16 at the time of the arrest. They were charged with misbehavior ranging from graffiti and shoplifting to assault and second or third degree robbery. That is taking property by force, but without a weapon or in a group where a robbery took place and they were part of that group. These young people and their families need painstaking support and careful fair supervision if they're to remain outside of institutions. Many of the alternative programs in place today in New York City are adaptations of proven national models to prevent violence. But no one is sure how well these adaptations will work in the long run. So this is something of an experimental phase in New York. Research shows that recidivism rates for children who have been incarcerated are so high that nearly everyone involved from the family court judges who sentence juveniles to the state officials who run the prisons, the juvenile correctional facilities, I should call them, is willing to try alternatives. In this report, you'll find a compelling set of articles exploring the alternative programs and what they take to succeed. One of the especially important points that we took away from this work was that when a child has a functional family, some parent or relative willing and able to take responsibility for them, there's usually a solution that can avoid placement in a correctional facility. The big question is what will it take to reinvest dollars from the closure of some of those upstate facilities that are no longer full in programs that can work with kids, for example, those who don't have functional families, where we have to build new structures for them, find and involve more kin or foster homes specialized foster homes and more effective community-centered alternatives for hundreds of kids with very serious mental health issues. As I mentioned, our advisory board uh, helped us draft a set of recommendations that you can find starting on page three. I'll just talk about two or three of those. For example, the board calls for the governor to require the state mental health system to divert or transfer seriously mental ill children out of OCFS facilities if necessary to residential treatment programs where court-involved youth should have priority for available slots. Another recommendation calls for the expansion of alternative to placement programs with intensive wraparound supports for families and children dealing with mental health issues, like the Blue Sky program. We know these programs work. Recidivism and re-arrest rates are substantially lower for the children who participate in them. They're absolutely not perfect, and we'll talk about um, some of the issues related to how many kids leave those programs and either go back to placement or commit new crimes. But by comparison to those incarcerated, it's a different, very different story. The board also recommends the closure of the largest upstate OCFS correctional facilities, advocating a policy that would shift more children closer to the city in smaller, more therapeutic programs that involve parents and families. Before we go into our discussion with the panel, I just wanted to make one more point. The Department of Justice report has offered a special opportunity, what's known in schools of public affairs as a policy window. With the federal government demanding reforms, the state has to respond. They've already sent one letter to DOJ basically saying, we're negotiating, we want to talk with you. But this is a moment, this is a big moment for the governor. There's no room for drift and no allowance for the status quo unless he's willing to have the, steps, the feds step in. So as many, of, as many of you know, and many of you are participating on task forces and other groups that are coming up with recommendations for OCFS for what they should put forward in these negotiations and what the governor should do. 
Um, that policy window will remain open only for the next few months, I fear. And it's open in the midst of a horrific fiscal crisis. So there will have to be some serious political will from Albany to drive reform, to work with OCFS and its unions that have been unhappy with some of the reform plans, and to solve problems that are messing up the lives of young people, kids who are just 15 years old and younger, for the most part. So thanks for listening to all of that. Um, now we're going to go to the panel discussion. Um, I want to invite our panelists up to the table. Um, I'm going to moderate the discussion, and there will be a great deal of time in the latter part of the session for you all to contribute, um, to ask questions and to make remarks and so on. Um, well, I shouldn't even say make remarks, but very short comments. Um, I want to engage as many of you as we can, because I know a lot of you are working in this field and know more about it than I do. Um, when we get to that point, a couple of our staff will be walking around with microphones, so just raise your hand and they can find you. So I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, the one who's not here is Assemblyman William Scarborough. Spoke with him last night, he said he'd be here, so I'm hoping he will still show up. Um, at the far end of the table is Tammy Steckler. Tammy is attorney in charge of the Juvenile Rights Division of the Legal Aid Society, she is the law guardians for the children in the uh, juvenile delinquency part of the um, family court, not to mention all the other parts of the family court, but that's what we're talking about today. Next to her is Larry Bushing, who is chief of the family court division of the New York City Law Department, which is the division responsible for the prosecution of juveniles in New York City and the enforcement of interstate child support orders. For several years previously, he was head of the domestic violence unit at the Manhattan DA's office. Next to him is John Ruiz, who is a youth counselor in workforce development for OCFS. And he has been there working with the agency for 30 years. And he's elect, he is executive board member of Public Employees Federation of Regions 9 to 12. Where he's, um, he's been on the board for the last year, and he's been on the downstate council for the last 20 years of the union. And beside him is Sylvia Rollins, who is a, a director of the Blue Sky program at New York Foundling, where she came from the Office of Children and Family Services, where she was a staff psychologist at the Youth Leadership Academy and in other divisions of the agency for many years. So she brings us some perspective from inside that agency, as well as perspective regarding her program. So I want to start by exploring this question of who are these kids that we're talking about. Unfortunately, we don't have anybody at the table who's been through that system. As most of the kids, we, as I said before, most of the kids we spoke with in the report don't want their identity known. It's not exactly an easy situation to find a kid who's been through the system, a young person who's been through the system and ready to talk about it. But Larry, can you start us off by telling me a little bit about the young people you see in court every day? Okay. Um, I guess maybe I can do it best with kind of a funnel approach and, and describe and kind of who Close to the microphone, please. Tammy moved my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth a try. <laughs> so I'm happy it's still on. So um, <clears throat> maybe I can describe kind of the funnel that it goes through. There's about 13,000 arrests um, in the last couple of years in New York City of um, juvenile delinquents, uh, juvenile delinquent cases. Uh, about 30% of those cases get um, uh, adjusted by the Department of Probation, meaning that they um, receive a non-judicial intervention. Um, can be restitution, can be monitoring for, for 60 days, it can be a letter of apology, uh, something along that, those lines. Um, beyond that, um, if, if they do not adjust the case, the Department of Probation will refer the case to us. Um, we then do a screening and we determine whether the charges are legally sufficient and whether there's um, uh, whether there's a case to be brought, whether, whether we want to bring a case. Um, we generally bring somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the cases that uh, come there. 
Um, beyond that, um, the cases then come to court. Um, they can range from, hopefully the idea of, of engaging in that process is to weed out a lot of the lower level offenses. Um, so uh, by doing that, um, hopefully we bring cases that really need court intervention rather than cases that are just uh, low level where not, somebody's not gonna need um, any type of really significant intervention. Um, and so then we go through that process. The, the, uh, the outcomes can range from um, an adjournment and contemplation dismissal up to placement. Um, the crimes can range from um, uh, shoplift, graffiti on the low end to uh, robberies, serious robberies. Um, we even occasionally get some homicides each year. Um, so you have the full kind of gamut there. Um, the kids themselves are generally from the areas that um, <clears throat> uh, face lots of issues, lots of issues with poverty, lots of issues with problems with the schools, lots of child welfare issues. Um, you can see all of that uh, play out in court. I think, Andrew, you painted a picture of, uh, in many respects, the many issues and the complex problems um, that the kids that come through the court system um, present. Um, it's uh, obviously disproportionately uh, minority, um, and that's an issue that we have to struggle with. Um, and, and that's essentially who's coming through. So um, a, a population that presents a lot of challenges um, and also I would say some opportunities as well. Tammy, can you describe the, the young people that your lawyers are representing? So what I would have to say is that the last the last thing I would describe is the crimes they commit. The first thing I would describe is that these are children as young as nine, as old as 15. And the other thing I just want to point out is that these are children, as Larry said, that are from our poorest communities, whose families are overstressed, under-supported, the communities are under-resourced. And these kids come in, and they may have allegedly committed what, it, what if they were adult would be a crime, but the crimes are basically low level, which I think that Larry will agree to. For the most part, they're misdemeanor crimes, low level crimes. At, not all, Larry, no. I know some of them are not, <laughs> but for the most part they are. But the more important thing is, you know, before I was in my position, I actually was an attorney for the, ch for the child doing trial work for juvenile delinquency cases. And the most amazing thing is what these kids are are really just kids. That's who they are. They're kids. They're like my kids. They remind me of my kids. They, you know, they could be sullen. They could be, they could be partly rude. They could be doing things they know are inappropriate. Sometimes they're not going to school, but they're, they're not doing things that a lot of our adolescent kids are not doing. You know, I, I like to use a joke that say that these kids are my husband, you know, pretty much 20 years ago. My husband did a lot of what these kids did growing up in Brooklyn. Although he was a white Irish kid and the cops took him by the back of his shirt collar and dropped him at his parents' front door. You know, these kids aren't being dropped back at their parents' front door. And there are lots of reasons these kids aren't. But I, you know, I was kidding with Larry earlier and I said, these kids for some reason are coming through a prosecution system where kids that are white are not. So there is a justice system working somewhere for those kids and it's working and it's robust with family support and community support and services and mental health uh, mental health services, it's, these kids don't have these services, their communities aren't supported in the way white communities are, and therefore they end up being prosecuted for what is typically a lot of normative adolescent behavior that I believe, uh, and I should, I should track this over 20 years, that most of them, if you left them alone, let them go through adolescence with the proper supports, both parental and community, and educationally, they would end up being okay. They would end up being grown-ups, like most of us. Not me, but most of us. <laughs> but I as you're listening to this, I really want you to just keep remembering these are nine-year-olds who still come into your room at night with nightmares and want to sleep with their mom and dad, right? These are, these are 10, 11, 12, 13-year-olds. These are young kids who really end up in this system when they shouldn't be there in the first place. They should be in their communities with proper supports. John, what, sorry. John what's, what's your take on who these kids are? Where, where, what do you make of what you just heard? Well, well, I like to say that in the legal arena, uh, there's due process and there's an opportunity there for the law guardian to do intervention and prevent the youngsters from uh, being uh, committed to the Office of Children and Family Services. 
and uh, more importantly, the judges have uh, the power to stipulate certain uh, treatment and, and, and course of action for that for that uh, youngsters that's being placed with the Office of Children and Family Services. Uh, you know, given the fact that these youngsters come from poor communities, uh, youngsters, Hispanics, and and African Americans by and large are are being set aside in, in, in a system that doesn't have the infrastructure to deal with the with the mental health uh, care issues that these youngsters come into into our system with. Mm -hmm. uh, so saying that, uh, uh, we the, the Department of Justice uh, came out with a report that the union totally embraces. We've been saying what the Department of Justice findings are, we've been saying that for the last 30 years, that we need more mental health practitioners, that we need more folks that are have the knowledge to deal with the mental health uh, disorders that these youngsters are coming uh, into our system with. Sylvia, to what degree is mental health a core um, part of the sort of situation of the of the problems or the or the issues that the children you're working with face? Um, so, 100% of the kids who are in blue sky. Put the mic. One hundred percent of the kids who are in Blue Sky have a Axis One diagnosis of conduct disorder um, with an accompanying ADHD. So they all have some pretty significant mental health illness. Um, and about thirty, depending on it, it's a, it's sort of a cyclical experience. Depending on the cycle, between thirty and sixty percent percent of them also have a seri another serious emotional um, disability, whether it's bipolar disorder, um, parent relational issues. Um, uh, a large percentage of our kids have a diagnosable cannabis abuse issue, and about the same 30 to 60 percent of them present with a with a adult caregiver with a significant mental health illness. And do you have a sense of how common those um, sort of characteristics are across the uh, children who would be? I mean, your your kids coming into Blue Sky would have been placed if not for the program, right? They Correct. would have gone so. How common are those characteristics across the population of kids that are sent upstate? Um, so our kids are the kids who have been recommended by, by probation as kids who, who need placement. So I, th that's the same kids that, uh, that are currently being placed. And I, and I would also like to add that by far and above the majority of our kids are, come from a low average IQ, um, which also contributes to um, their ability to address mental health illness and their, you know, their ability to, to make use of some of the community-based options. Right. So I guess the next obvious question then is, should any of these young people be sent into a correctional facility? What is the, sort of where is the line that one draws to decide that this child needs to be put in a lockup or this child needs to be put in a nonprofit residential center, or this, or another child can be sent to placement. Larry, do you want to talk sure. about that? Um, <clears throat> I think as a as a starting point, it's important to to note that um, the the condition of the facilities is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. There's there's no question about that. Um, so when you see a report like the DOJ report, obviously that's somewhere where you really don't want to send anybody. And one of the issues is um, when you send a kid uh, to OCFS, you cannot, you have no idea of knowing where that uh, child is going to go. So, and the, the judges have no control over that. So it truly is something that um, uh, is, is a very weighty decision and something that is taken um, with a great deal of thought. Judges are required and we advocate for the least restrictive alternative under the circumstances. So that having been said, uh, it's important I think to note as well that there's an important, the judges are also supposed to consider public safety, as are we. And um, when we look at that, we look to see um, that the best uh, single indicator of the likelihood of this individual committing a further violent offense is if they have committed a violent offense. So, um, so if we see a kid who has had repeated um, violent behavior, including uh, about 25% of the arrests are for robbery, about another 25% are assault, 
the victims themselves are in fact uh, mostly children, although other vulnerable people like elderly, a lot of delivery people. Um, so we look at those things to determine what are the, the real kids that you couldn't possibly serve some other way. A certain percentage of them are kids who just uh, don't succeed in the programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and you try an alternative to placement. Um, you already have a recommendation for uh, placement from the Department of Probation, often from um, mental health. And um, in spite of that, about two-thirds of the time, we still end up consenting to that young person going into uh, an evidence-based program to give that a try. In fact, um, I think the numbers are probably somewhat higher, um, particularly if we have a, a good communication back and forth like we do with uh, Sylvia. So, so really, um, it should be a last, a last resort. And um, as you can see, I think, from the numbers over the last several years, the system has moved increasingly in that direction. Um, I would say that there are two populations, and I think you identified them in your opening remarks, of kids that are in there that I think we can pull out, mm -hmm. that should, we should have better resources for. One of which is kids who go into the system because they have no, um, uh, no reasonable um, caregiver, somebody that can be responsible for them. And um, we have repeatedly tried to make the point that these are kids who don't need to be in there, they need a resource, they don't need to be in, in any sort of facility. Um, but those services are, are <coughs> relatively far and few between. Um, similarly, the mental health, kids with severe mental health issues, there's a lack of resources there. OMH will take some kids, but that process is extremely long, extremely difficult, um, and, and very selective. Tammy, is, is that, do you have a, the same take? You know, Larry and I agree about almost everything, so it would be unusual <laughs> if I didn't have the same take. Um, I'll start by saying I really, really like Larry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> no, no, I do like that. I want to say that I speak from a position mm -hmm. where I am free of the concern of public safety. You know, we are defense attorneys, and our goal, obviously, is to serve. And I feel like Ouch. that's a good freedom to have, <laughs> a freedom from that concern, because everybody else is worrying about that. I don't really need to. Um, I do want to say that if I asked all of you to raise your hand, if you have a conduct disorder, you should all raise your hand. Because you all have one, according to the mental health evaluators in, fa in family court. Kids are always diagnosed with conduct disorders if they're not behaving in a way that we see as adults as appropriate. I, I think conduct disorder is, you know, is probably a, a valid um, diagnosis, but it often is confused with adolescence, I think. I also want to say that, you know, I keep hearing that, you know, Larry raised a great issue, which is sometimes there's no resource for a kid, right? So, so that's such an interesting dynamic to me, right? Is there's no resource for a child, we blame that child for the lack of resource, and we place him in OCFS. We take him out of his community, him out of his home. You know, you don't get to dump our children this way, right? You don't get to... Administration with Children's Services is forever bringing abuse and neglect petitions against parents who don't care for their kids. We don't care for our children. We don't blame it on the child. Those kids don't come in on abuse and neglect cases and we say, what's wrong with you? We say, what's wrong with the family? How can we make this family whole? These are the same kids. So, you know, I'm way, way over here and I think you could show me, maybe I could find two kids I think need to be placed away from their home. I understand judges don't have great alternatives. I understand we need to have more money, but it is not an excuse to have no better alternative when you think a kid should not be in placement and place him there because there are no resources for him. He should be in a foster home. We should be creating those foster homes. We should be developing those foster homes for those children. Placing them is not an option. And I also just want to say one more thing. You know, violent behavior, that, that term violence is sort of an interesting behavior because you've asked 10 legal aid attorneys to define violence and 10 corp counsels to define violence. I think you'd have some completely different definitions, right? So violent, for instance, 11-year-old yesterday brought in, fought with his mom. His mom actually called the police. He w refused to take his medication and he hit his mother. He's 11 years old. He was psychiatrically hospitalized a week ago. He is reading on a second grade level, so not doing well in school. So that, was that violent? He's being charged with an assault crime. That's what he's being charged with, 11 for that. Does that make him a violent offender? I don't think anyone in here would think that's true. He's not a violent offender. But if he has a finding on that case, if that case goes, to trial and he gets a finding, he's going to see, be seen as a violent offender. Um, another case, two, a 15-year-old yesterday in court fighting with his 24-year-old brother. 
has serious mental health needs, I'm gonna send them to Sylvia, has serious, not because you have mental health needs, because you can help him. <laughs> um, serious, mental, serious mental health needs, the family's trying to get him treatment, it's not succeeding, he's fighting with his 24 year old brother. They take him out of the home and remand him because the 24 year old lives in the home. So again, we have a 15 year old who's being blamed for the dysfunction in his family as well as his own mental health, which he, he's not able to go get services for himself. So, you know, kids that are playing, you know, I, I would say, in my opinion, most of the kids we see, and we see them in a very different way, right, than Corp Council, because we're in their homes, we're in their schools, we're meeting with them, we're meeting with their, with their parents, with their grandparents, we know them intimately, and I would say most of these kids do not need to be placed away from home. They need some wraparound services for their family, I wanna just say that loud and clear, not just for them, for their family and their communities. So that's basically what Sylvia does. Um, That's why I mean, we love a, Sylvia. <laughs> it's, a, it's a relatively small program, right? How many, how many young people are you working with now? So at any point in time, we have 60 families. And um, why don't you describe the work and how you work with families and so on? Just give people a thumbnail sketch. Okay. Okay. And so first I'd like to say you can see how interesting my job is to stand someplace between Larry and Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to consider public safety. I have to consider public safety. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so a thumbnail sketch of what we do. So these families uh, that we work with, um, as, as uh, Mr. Ruiz mentioned, don't often benefit from the community-based treatment that they're offered, and they don't get the full dose of treatment. So our job is to try and figure out a way to help the families get the full dose of treatment. We do that by going into the homes. Uh, we do strictly home-based treatment. We work with the entire family. Um, and, there, and so it, you all have read the research. There's a lot of evidence that would say that you need to work with the entire family and engage the entire family. So we go in, we engage the family, we try and deliver a full dose of treatment, which means that depending on the model, somewhere between three and nine months of treatment, um, the therapists are all uh, licensed uh, mental health providers. They go through some pretty significant training and quality assurance. They're in consultation every week for three and a half hours. Um, they have to tape all of their sessions so that A, we know the sessions are being done, B, we know what's being done in the sessions, a national consultant reviews all their work. Um, we also treat the entire family. So while the, the youth who has been referred to us may be the identified client, if there's a parent with mental health issues, we treat that. If there's a parent with substance abuse issues, we treat that. If there are siblings with mental health or substance abuse, we deliver the treatment in that. Um, we do everything individually. So we don't refer our kids out to group <coughs> treatments. We don't refer them out to community-based mental health or to community-based substance abuse treatment. Our therapists are trained in um, probably one of few evidence-based models for substance abuse treatment. And we provide the family the resources they need to continue the delivery of the, of the substance abuse treatment when we walk away. And how many of the kids who are in your program end up having to be placed nonetheless? Um, so it's a really good point. I'd like to say that we're perfect with every family. <laughs> um, but about uh, somewhere between, so, uh, around a third of them wind up uh -huh. being terminated um, from Blue Sky. And why? What, is, what leads to that? Termination. So um, a good portion of the terminations are a result of what we call noncompliance behavior with the Department of Probation. Mm -hmm. So they may not keep curfew, they may not be going to school, they may be still testing, uh, ha having dirty UDSs. Um, you want to say what that is? Oh, sorry. Um, so our therapists do, do random urine screens, so they may come back with a, with, with a consistent dirty uh, urine screen. They may be violated. Um, about a half of the kids who have been rearrested, and, and so, so I'm, I'm really nervous about giving you information because it, it's really sort of um, meaningless data at this point because we haven't done a clinical trial on the model, but a number of the kids, about a half of the kids who are rearrested were able to, to work with Corporation Council and Legal Aid and keep them in the program mm -hmm. so that they actually get to complete a full dose of treatment. So by, by, a large, by far and away, most of our, our failed cases are noncompliance BOPs. That's one of the interesting points we heard from several of the programs is that often a lot of the rearrests don't knock the kid out of the program. In fact, it's sort of chalked up to a learning experience. Um, is that taking, taking it too lightly or is, or is that true? Um, 
so a, a lot of rearrests do not result in kids being knocked out of the program, but a good majority of our rearrests are things like jumping turnstiles, mm -hmm. um, so trespassing, and, and a number of the Blue Sky kids have been arrested for trespassing in their own buildings. So there's a lot of police presence kinds of crimes that we have to deal with on a, on a regular basis. Um, very, I, I can say that very few of our kids do significant violent reoffenses while they're with us. So yeah, so, so, so an, a rearrest doesn't necessarily knock them out. Is it conceivable to you that a program, a program like yours or programs with, for specific populations, such as a program that would integrate services like you're talking about with foster families or a program that is focused on more specific mental health and chemical abuse needs, are, are, um, is it possible that those programs could be much larger and still be at capacity? I mean, in other words, fewer kids in placement, more kids in these programs. Um, I, would, I would like to think so. It's, so it, it's hard for me to say that Blue Sky is a successful model because you, 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 Blue Sky is an adaptation of MST, multisystemic right. therapy, functional family therapy, multidimensional treatment, foster care. And while we're adherent to all of those models so we could guess that our outcomes would be fairly strong, we're an adaptation that requires study for us to, to replicate it. And the developers who are in charge of the models won't won't let that happen until there's a clinical trial. And we've been working with Tammy and, and Larry for months now to figure out how New York City can do a clinical trial on Blue Is Sky. there funding for it? Um, there's New York Foundling funding for it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, which gets to that question I'd like to put to everybody across the table. I mean, are, at what point do we reach this point where, I mean, right now there's 813, between 820 and 900 kids in OCFS placements, there are roughly the same number in nonprofit placements. At what point is that number, can you not knock that any lower? I mean, at what point are the kids that are in placement kids who need to be there? I think, Andrew, you need to say also <clears throat> at what point would those numbers reverse themselves back to the point that these youngsters uh, are offending again to the point that they need uh, uh, a, a place to a timeout period. Mm -hmm. At what point would that happen? And we could consider when the uh, adult mental health system uh, started uh, deinstitutionalizing their uh, patients and, and bringing them back into the community. And ho and behold, the nonprofits and the privates <laughs> Uh, we're not given the adequate funding to treat them. Mm -hmm. Consequently, you have many of them now incarcerated uh, because uh, of their conditions, the mental health conditions. I'd like to go back to uh, respond to the legal arena. Again, uh, they, they have the opportunity to due process. They have law guardians. They have uh, 18B lawyers that represent these children in the judicial process whereby they have an opportunity to go forward with me uh, mental health reports. But even the mental health reports and those practitioners don't agree on, on, on the mental health conditions. You may have three psychi psychiatric reports all saying something different. Now the trial of facts, uh, the judge is there, he's, he or she may be the trial of facts. Where, 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 which report do you give weight to? Mm -hmm. So the professionals have to uh, 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 sit down and, and come up with some standard whereby these youngsters are placed appropriately and then treat, uh, treat, treat appropriately. We, uh, as the unit has requested to be part of the DO, DOJ recommendations, and we haven't heard one response from this current administration or from, or from the governor. And an assist, and, and uh, a climate where you go around targeting the workforce, uh, always creating as an alienation in a work environment that's, uh, that's at this point a hostile work environment, both for the children and the staff. And that shouldn't be in this economic time. We need to come to the table, the private state entities, the, the, the lawyers, and, and let me point out about the privates. We, I do wonderful work and partnerships with the, with the privates, and, and they do work. The nonprofits. Uh, the nonprofits. Yeah. Uh, what, a class in point, I'm working on a project that just got funded uh, with Henry Street Settlement, 
whereby these kids that come back into the community are going to explore uh, different opportunity, opportunities with uh, the healthcare industry, give them exposures. They're going to get training, uh, workforce uh, readiness uh, workshops, and, there, and thereafter be placed in, in a job, an internship uh, with a stipend. And, and these are kids who were in OCFS placement? That's correct. So those type of partnerships uh, we, we must, must embrace. So I want to come back to that issue of um, the union and what it's like to work in these facilities. But before we do that, I want to introduce Assemblyman William Scarborough from Queens. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Mr. Scarborough has been in the State Assembly since uh, 1994, representing the 29th District. And you are on committees that oversee human services and juvenile justice and other um, related topics. So what is you know, what is the chance of us making headway now? What with this Department of Justice report? What with the budget crisis? Is there a chance to f still find um, a way to push reforms through the, the window while it's open? Well, I think, uh, well, first, thank you for uh, having me. Um, pleased to be here. I am the chair of the Assembly's Committee on Children and Families. And uh, these are issues that we've been grappling with for a number of years. Um, I think in, in your sentence, you probably encapsulated the two opposing forces. Uh, one is the Department of Justice report, and the other uh, is the budget crisis. Um, I think the Department of Justice report represents, on the one hand, a uh, pretty strong indictment of the system as it exists uh, in terms of um, the way that uh, the children have been treated, and also in terms of the lack of resources uh, that are available uh, to provide them with the kind of treatment, the kind of services uh, that the system needs to make it a, um, uh, what one would consider to be an adequate system. Um, I, I think that in order to uh, meet the concerns that are listed in the DOJ report, and Commissioner Carrion, I think, has indicated that the department is not going to litigate. They're going to try to uh, work and um, meet the recommendations. Uh, it is certainly going to require resources, because uh, it was clearly pointed out that a big part of the problem has to do with lack of mental health resources, a uh, lack of substance abuse resources, uh, a lack of a lot of therapeutic uh, services, besides uh, certain endemic cultural problems uh, within the system that need to be worked out. Um, but in order to do that, uh, there's going to have to be uh, money put into the system to do these things. And it's going to be uh, a challenge, to say the least, to do that when the governor has just indicated that he wants us to go back and cut $5 billion. And some of those cuts come in the child welfare and uh, areas that impact this. Now, um, one of the things that, uh, in, in response to the question that you just mentioned about how far down we can go, I think one of the things that we need to look at, and I think it's clear to all of us, is that most of the children in the uh, juvenile justice system come from certain communities, and, and they can be pretty much geographically determined. Um, and one of the points that was raised in the report is that there are not enough services. There are not enough substance abuse services. There are not enough mental health services. There are not enough uh, the kinds of things that would allow these young people to stay in the community and be served in the community as opposed to being put into these facilities. So I think one indicator of how far we can go is once we reach the point where these communities have the same access of the same level of substance abuse and mental health and other services that can, be, that can then divert children who uh, sometimes are put in simply because the services are not there. And so if we could reach a point where there is at least an adequate amount of those services in that community so that kids are not being put in the facility simply because there's no place for them to go, then you can weed out the ones who actually 
uh, need to be in the facilities, but we're no, nowhere near there at this point. So do you foresee the Assembly and the Senate going back and approving Governor Patterson's proposed budget cuts? Well, I, I can't say what we're going to do right now. I mean, I can tell you that in my arena, I'm prepared to uh, make a strong argument and a strong fight that uh, given, even given the, the financial circumstances, it would be penny wise and pound foolish to make those kind of cuts, especially in view of the fact that the, the uh, federal government has made an indictment on the system. Now, you know, what often happens is that you start to parse things out and you may end up not receiving cuts in juvenile justice or even an increase, but cuts in other areas. Right. And so, you know, these are all the things that we're going to have to work out. Is it conceivable that they could fund reforms at just these four facilities and make cuts elsewhere, including to the community-based services that you were talking about, and still win um, what they need for the, from the well, Department that, of Justice? Well, that, that's, that's going to be the challenge. Um, I, it, one could try to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be successful. I think it's pretty clear that the whole system, and you can't just look at the facilities. You have to look at uh, the community-based uh, services. And I mean, really, you need to look at other things, such as the preventive services that keep this, the, the, the cases from even rising to that level. Uh, if you're really going to look at the, the systemic problem, mm -hmm. um, I'm hopeful that uh, the Department of Justice report and the things that have kind of risen up in the, as a result of that will uh, make a strong case that even in this fiscal crisis, we have to look at the long term and look at what we're doing uh, to these children and for these children. Right. So we've heard what the Justice Department says about what's happening in these, particularly these four facilities, including some of the largest ones upstate. John, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to work in a juvenile correctional facility and <clears throat> the issues that your union members are facing? Well, one, one of being very stressful at this point, uh, they, they introduce a new model, new treatment model in, at, at these facilities. At the same time, they uh, change the regulations in terms of child abuse. Uh, which puts the professional staff uh, in a position where they're scared to confront uh, misbehavior or, or uh, uh, get involved in any restraints for the fear of losing their professional licenses. Uh, I'm talking about the teachers, I'm talking about the social workers, uh, the psychologists that work at our facilities. Uh, and the paraprofessionals are afraid to uh, uh, say anything to a youngster uh, in respect to misbehavior, behavior, uh, which is creating an atmosphere of uh, violence, which is not a good therapeutic uh, uh, position to be in when you, you're trying to uh, change the system. Uh, and, and also uh, is demoralizing the, the, the workforce and uh, making it very difficult uh, to go forward. So you're saying that the the effort to move to a more therapeutic model is creating an atmosphere that's unworkable? That's well, when you have, when you have a non-support of the staff and uh, targeting the staff as being the, the, the problem for going forward in the implementation of uh, the sanctuary model that uh, the state is currently uh, involved in, uh, the staff feels alienated. Instead mm -hmm. of going, uh, coming from a position to embrace the staff and find out what are the issues, what are their concerns in, 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 a, in the process, uh, we, we've taken, uh, uh, like I said before, we have not even been invited to uh, address the DOJ report uh, with suggestions and recommendations or, uh, at all. So what would you so, all but, suggest? But, 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 this administration, past administrations will implement therapeutic models and tell the professional staff this is what you have to do. And when it doesn't work out and they don't get the uh, outcomes that uh, they thought they, they were going to get, they blame the workforce. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not fair. How would, um, 
from your personal experience, what would you want to see? I mean, you say you agree with most of what's in that report. What would you want to see in terms of a change in staffing or change in the model of, of frontline work? Well, I, I, I like to uh, uh, come from a position of getting to yes together. Get, get the folks involved, the privates, uh, the state, uh, the court system involved in the process of helping these, the, these children. I like to see a system where perhaps maybe you can employ an individual uh, service plan where everyone comes to the table and says what uh, uh, the youngster is going to receive while in treatment. I, I like to see a system where uh, the length of stay uh, won't put so much pressure on the staff that has to address deficiencies that have been going on perhaps for decades with respect to children not going attending school, uh, expect the system to bring uh, Jose or Tyrone's reading grade up uh, three or four levels in, in, in a course of six months. Uh, when I was a counselor, and I'm going back years, perhaps uh, 25 years, uh, there was a time where we had the opportunity to talk about simple things with youngsters. Personal hygiene was one of them. My youngsters used to come to the facility, uh, they were never taught about personal hygiene, hygiene, how to make a bed, how to do laundry, basic things that uh, we uh, as folks take for granted. Uh, these, these children come from impoverished background. Many of them come, as you well know, you're in the business, single parents, uh, we have to start treating also the, the parents. The parents have to get involved too. Uh, you could spend a, a million dollars in therapy per child, but if that child has to go back to a dysfunctional family, most likely the success is not going to be uh, recorded uh, because he's going to revert back to his old peers uh, and perhaps reoffend. And, and, and I sit here and I talk about reoffending, and, and, and one case comes to mind where a youngster had a limited secure uh, placement, which is uh, a 12 month placement with the option of returning back, in, back to a family court for an extension based on inappropriate behavior in the community. However, Jose uh, went to a private facility and he got rearrested for a minor crime, and, and I thought it was a minor crime, and winded up at Supreme Court, Supreme Court matter. Now, when these youngsters go back uh, and are adjudicated as a juvenile offender, uh, now they're facing correctional time, which right. means is that they're going to have a longer uh, length of stay with the Office of Children Fam Family Service. Uh, in addition to the, the crime, and the sentence, perhaps he's graduates into the adult system. But isn't, so, I mean, unfortunately, OCFS can't be part of this panel because they're involved in conversations with the Department of Justice. So, you know, we would have, Gladys Carrion would have been here, but she can't be. So, I want to try and channel this conversation a little bit. And sort of if, if the issue is kids coming back, cycling over and over through the system, and that being one of the key problems that your workers are facing, is, doesn't that beg the question of the need for a more therapeutic approach or, or a radically different approach to what's happening upstate or in these facilities? Well, uh, like I indicated before, you need to hire the, the mental health practitioners. Uh, you, you have to retrain the staff to deal with mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to train the staff in uh, uh, the purpose of psychotropic medications. You have to train the staff to determine the symptoms of these medications being administered to the children. You have to, you have to educate the children on the purpose of these psychotropic medications. Uh, you have to uh, uh, get their consent uh, for administering these psychotropic medications. Mm -hmm. You have to uh, uh, create a, a plan for transition back into the community where there's going to be a loving parent, hopefully or guardian, that's going to monitor uh, that youngster to ensure that he takes his medication, attends his mental health uh, uh, appointments, uh, ensures that he has proper recreation. A lot of the, our kids don't know 
what good re recreation is. Uh, most of them believe that uh, hanging out in the corner, that's recreation. Right. And that's when they get into mischief and, 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 and problems occur. Right. Uh, and, and thereafter, you, you, you need to expose them to different occupations. Uh, here so, we sit and in, in, in currently in, in the new uh, technologies such as nanotechnology and our youngsters are be, still being taught how to uh, 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 create a resume. Right. Uh, we need to challenge, uh, challenge our youngsters to higher front, uh, frontiers in terms of education. Okay. Tammy, you look like you're eager to say something. How much time do we have? Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> I got an hour. All right. I think I can cover everything. Um, you know, I just want to say, I, whatever the issues are, however difficult it is to work in these facilities, children's constitutional rights are being violated, and that is not okay. I also want to talk about imbalance of power, because in, in the juvenile justice system, there is a huge imbalance of power from the arrest when it's a kid versus a police officer, to these facilities when it's grown people with children. There's always an imbalance of power. And, the, and when there's an imbalance of power, it's incumbent upon the adults to do whatever is possible to even that out, right? It, it's not okay to be stressed out at work and take it out on a kid. I can't do that to my kids when I get in. I, I try not to. To my kids when I get home, it's wrong for me to do. Adults that are responsible for children in any setting have to remain responsible. I also want to talk about the restraints because I think this is a very important issue and it was highlighted in the DOJ report. The restraints were out of control when Commissioner Carrion began her, her tenure, out of control. And if you talk to our clients, and again, imbalance of power because who's listening to a 13-year-old? Only, you know, only some of us. Um, the imbalance of power is astounding. So if you talk to our clients about what they're being restrained for, and I just want to say, you could restrain a kid for things that are much more than I think you should in the new policy. Right, to prevent a youth from harming himself or somebody else, to prevent escape or AWOL, or to, uh, or to escort a youth who is causing or threatening to cause an immediate serious disturbance. That's a lot of leeway. I think that's a lot of leeway. So I just want to say that you can restrain a kid. Uh, you know, I don't think you should be able to, but you can. Okay, uh, you can. And the problem is, is that kids are getting restrained. Our clients report being restrained, restrained for making a face, for not moving quickly enough, for not getting off the phone quickly enough, these are not in any policy. I don't see these in any policy. But if you talk to our kids, this is what they're getting restrained for. And I also want to just point out that there is a grievance procedure within these facilities. But just as adults often don't grieve, as we learned from the Riker situation, where the adolescent boys, men, were sort of monitoring themselves, and they were effectuating punishment, kids also have a very difficult time grieving against the adults that are taking care of them. It is a very difficult procedure, and right now it is very difficult for kids to grieve, and it's very difficult to file a lawsuit because of the Prisoners Litigation Reform Act, which makes it that you have to grieve all the way up before you can file a lawsuit. So there's a lot, kids say they don't grieve for two reasons. One is staff retaliation, but the other is other kid retaliation, that sometimes kids don't like you to grieve. There's a lot of power and control going on here that is unhealthy for children to be living in. I also just want to make two more points about one point that uh, Mr. Ruiz made, which I thought was a great point, is the facilities don't work. We all know 89% recidivism rate for boys in the latest report. Where else in our world would we accept that? That is a complete and utter failure, which means the facilities as they are not working. Now, Commissioner Carrion's trying the sanctuary model because it's been successful in other venues and because it teaches our kids what we want them to learn, which is a therapeutic model. Work through your problems. Talk them through. Figure it out with us. So, you know, there's, there's no question that in this room, if these were your children, you would rather someone be talking to them about why they need to get off the phone on time versus taking them down in a restraint. And I really want you to keep thinking about your children when we're talking about this. This is your children, all right? The, the, the last thing I want to say is an interesting thing happened, and I know um, that this probably wasn't a great thing for the people that work there, but there's a system in place that actually records every restraint, who does it, what the situation was, and since that's been in place, restraints have gone down dramatically. And of course, we, we all know what the reason for that is, right? Because when you're being watched, you're gonna be more careful about the things you're doing that are not appropriate, that are inappropriate. So we need a lot more oversight in this system. A lot more oversight it has to be independent oversight. Um, you know, we, it's a bad idea to let anyone sort of oversee themselves. I don't think that ever works well in any venue. But I will say that there is a, 
there is an obligation on the part of the people working in these facilities to remain the adults no matter what the situation, no matter how much a kid may push you or, or annoy you or aggravate you or taunt you, no matter how tired, angry, or stressed you are, your job is to remain the adult. So what about the, uh, the public safety issues here and the politics of public safety? To what degree, first of all, Larry, to what degree are the judges open, at least the judge, and is there a difference across boroughs, I wonder, to what degree are the judges open to alternatives to placement for kids who maybe two years ago wouldn't have gone that route, would have gone to placement when the numbers were high? Well, I, mean, think, I think the numbers tell a pretty significant story, right? Like, as you, as you mentioned at the beginning, um, over the last several years, arrests have increased pretty much every year. Right. Um, at varying, varying rates. Um, if you look at the initial dispositions on cases, so when the case first comes through, leaving out violations of probation, kids that are in a program and, and, and don't succeed in it. Um, if you look at how they've gone, I, I started in 2005, so just taking that as, as the baseline, um, there were 1,078 kids that were placed that year. 2006, 968, 2007, 945, 2008, um, a slight uptake, uptick, uh, 769. So you've seen a 28.7 percent decrease. Right. Now, um, one of the significant differences between 2005 and now is there's um, more programming. There's more options available. Um, we didn't have uh, JJ. We had the Esperanza program, which is a, which is a similar program. Um, but that had limited capacity. So if you look um, over that period of time, I think it's pretty clear the judges are, are uh, and obviously there are variances across boroughs, there are variances in individual judges, um, but there's an, there's an interest in it, there's uh, acceptance of it. Um, I think part of what has to happen to make that move even further is um, judges have to feel that there's confidence in the programs. And the, the, How does that happen? Okay, uh, two main things. One is, are they taking the right kids? Are they taking kids who are going to um, uh, be likely to succeed in that program? Um, and secondly, are they reporting back to the court accurately what's happening? So um, if a court decides, all right, I have a placement recommendation from the Department of Probation. I have a placement recommendation from the, uh, the mental health study. Um, Let's just say, you know, in, in a certain percentage that they're in one of those, in that third group, uh, a group that's one third of the cases where we uh, oppose the kid going into that program. Uh, and then the agency that they place that child with doesn't report accurately what's going on, minimizes behavior, apologizes for behavior, doesn't give the court what it needs in order to adequately supervise what's going on with that kid. That's going to undermine confidence in the program. I think the programs are getting that, um, but there's always, um, you know, there's often, uh, there's sometimes room for improvement in that as well. But I, I think the numbers show a pretty compelling story that they are interested in that. Um, additionally, when you, when you add into that, that certain numbers of the kids that are going to placement are not accepted by any alternative to placement, frequently for the reasons that we talked about before, child welfare reasons or uh, mental health reasons. Um, it shows an even more compelling story when you take those numbers out. Somebody high up in city government said to me their greatest fear is that one, just one incident could derail this whole thing. You know, one horrific crime committed by a kid who should, should have been, or who was in an alternative program. Is that, do you think that's true? Um, you know, I, I don't think you can govern a system by what you think is gonna appear on the front page of the New York Post. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think what we tell have, that to the child welfare field. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you, when you have data to support your decisions, uh, and you have a good reason for it, it's not just you know you're doing it based on a hunch. You're doing it because you have empirical data that shows the programs generally tend to do better. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know it's, that's why it's even more important to have studies that show the effectiveness of these particular programs. Uh, and, and when you have data to support your decision making, I think you're in good shape. Um, you know, you're always going to have situations, um, everybody's nightmare case is going to happen at some point. Mm -hmm. um, that's just the na it's just human nature. Um, but you know, they happen, uh, they certainly happen with kids that come out of placement. 
You know, kids are not uh, going to placement forever. They're coming back to the communities. Um, you know, many of them are reoffending, as, as Tammy pointed out. A lot of them are reoffending. So um, to say that one solution is, is going to not have that outcome uh, is not true. So, um, you know, and I, and I have to say, in my time here, I haven't seen uh, that case. Right. And it's been, it's been almost five years. Right. Assemblyman Scarborough. Mm -hmm. What is the politics of this? What are the politics of this in the state legislature? Is there support for something like redirect New York or some other method of shifting resources from the detention system or the, the placement system to alternatives? Well, that's that's a very good question, and I guess it depends on who you ask and where you ask them. Um, there is a substantial amount of. Uh, uh, political uh, support for these facilities and for maintaining these facilities. Uh, a lot of it is uh, regional. Um, there are areas in the state where these uh, juvenile facilities, as the adult facilities, uh, are actually part of the economic engine. Uh, that run communities and that keep communities uh, uh, going. And so when you have an effort to um, close them down or reduce them, uh, you run into not only a real um, uh, opinion on the part of people that there are kids who need to be there, you know, and, and I, I think uh, uh, the people who work in these facilities and run into some of the problems will tell you that they feel that these kids need to be there, you know, and we can have a real legitimate debate about that. But you also run into the fact that uh, these communities have become dependent upon these facilities when you start to talk about uh, reducing them or using alternatives and so on, you're threatening the economic viability of those communities those communities and the people who are threatened are then going to talk to their political representatives. And we have in the Assembly and the Senate really lively debates about where this should go, you know, what you should do with it. And to be honest, too, you know, you have to understand that when you look to close one of these down, you are affecting a whole community. And one of the things that we have not done is we have not looked at any comprehensive way of replacing them with something that will sustain that community and, and realizing that those are legitimate concerns. But does it, I mean, well, it just seems the question is, twisted it, to, I, yeah. to I base economic bias. And, 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 and that is precisely the, the issue. I'm, I'm just trying to, to I, No, I understand. Point out the I understand. That but that on. argument is now, how, that, do you, how does that hold water? Not, it is not. Uh, it is not sufficient to use that as a basis to continue to put kids happening. in these situations. I, you know, let me be clear. I'm not saying that, that that is the case. Sure. Because my view is that we do need, and, and as you know, I'm the sponsor of Redirect sure. Europe. So, you know, my view is that we do need to downsize. We do need to look at these alternatives. But when you ask me what the political no, environment yeah, absolutely. is, there, I'm I appreciate to your show channel you, in that perspective. You know, I'm trying to show you the kind of arguments and the things that right. we run into. So, in to I guess to to a bottom line answer to your question, uh, it's it's difficult to say. Uh, we will know, I guess, when we go forward with redirect and other things. Mm -hmm. I do think that this report is going to be a very significant uh, player in, in going mm -hmm. forward because I, I think Good. it indicates that the system as it exists is not working and we need to do other things. What about within your district and within Queens? Is there awareness of this issue? Is there a feeling that the system has to change? Do you hear from constituents about this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to, I, I Really, I think the debate is not even so much in New York City is not even downstate, it is really a regional debate. You know, this is one of the true things that kind of cuts in an upstate, downstate mm -hmm. uh, type of, of uh, manner. Um, because I, I, one of the, the issues is that the kids that are in these facilities, by and large, come from the city. And so there's a sense of our kids, you know, when you look at city people, our kids being 
the, the, the fodder for these facilities. Uh, whereas, again, as I mentioned, a lot of the facilities are upstate, you know, various communities outside of New York. And so they look at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So you really have even more so, I think, than a uh, party versus party issue, you have a regional divide. Is it even on the negotiating table to try and come up with some alternative economic carrot to, to well, yeah, there is. these upstate There, there, there is, and, and that, that's um, part of what we have done in the last couple of, of um, uh, budget uh, uh, sessions is to try to force some uh, funding for community reinvestment and right. for alternatives uh, because uh, you, it's not fair either to just either let the children out or keep them in the community without the community having the resources that they need. I mean, it's not that these kids don't have issues. You know, they have mental health issues, they have substance abuse and other issues, and you need to have facilities in the communities uh, to deal with those things if you're going to keep them there. So uh, we, we are pushing that. Okay. So we're going to go to questions in just one minute. So um, Karen and Anna, if, um, if, you want, if you have a question, please hold up your hands, and two people will come around and we'll take questions. Um, while they're getting ready for that, Sylvia, could you say a little bit about what you would like to see? What, what do you most want to see change um, as a result of the Justice Department report? Great question. Um, I think what I would like most to see change is, um, so, so when we were talking on the phone before this, uh, this panel discussion, we had discussed using evidence to drive our practice. And so when, when John was talking about the challenges in facilities and, and Tammy did a lovely job talking about the power and control issues inside those facilities, it's not surprising to research that those things are happening. So we have enough information out there to allow us to make really thoughtful, mindful decisions and then test them along the way. I'd love to see that be the policy assemblyman driving the uh, practice mm -hmm. forward. Right, <laughs> right. How about you, Tammy? Oh my goodness, it's a, it's a lot of question. I, you know, I just want to respond to, to something. Um, you know, the assemblyman has been fantastic around all these issues. We work really closely with him on these issues. But I want to say that it is very distressing to go up to Albany and talk about the closure of facilities. There are 300 empty beds in OCFS now. When Commissioner Karen was trying to close beds um, when she first came on board, she got a lot of resistance to closing those beds. And it's almost embarrassing to go up to Albany and listen to some of what is said about you know, the economics of it. And, and I, it's so simple to me, and maybe I hope to the people in this room, that we shouldn't be um, thinking about economics on the backs of the brown and black children from New York City. I, 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 I can't even see how that makes sense. I can't, it's embarrassing to me to make that argument. It makes me angry. We should all be angry about it because it is mostly our kids up there. Um, and I, I do believe that Commissioner Carrion has talked a lot about and has tried to, to put some plans in place for alternatives for state workers who, who, whose facilities are closed. And of course, people don't want to leave their communities. I understand all of that. But that is not an excuse for, for keeping these facilities open and keeping these kids placed up there. What I'd really like to see is a whole revamping of the system in terms of just stopping and looking for one minute at who and why we're sending kids away. Because we could talk all about the crimes, but most kids are sent away for social issues, which we talked about a lot here. They're not up there because of the crime they committed. They're up there because there's no family or they have a mental health issue that can't be treated. or so. This is, you know, I'd like to say bull. This is bold to put, to put kids away for that. And I also want to say that maybe those 300 beds, you know, I keep saying this, there are white kids out in New York City. I, show, I'm, I see them walking in the street. I know they exist. I don't live here, but I know they do. And they have shoplifting problems and school fights, and they do graffiti, and they smoke pot. Lots of them do. You know, I, where are they? We are finding a way to treat them within their communities because their families have money. How horrible for us that we are not doing the same thing for kids of color who have no money. So this is about poverty, this is about stress, and yes, we need evidence-based programs that we can prove they work. I'm perfectly, I, I couldn't believe more that Blue Sky is gonna, when they do the random trials, is gonna show some great results. But we gotta get these kids back in the community. We need to stop accepting excuses upstate in Albany about why this can't happen. These kids don't have home visits, they can't work with their families, they go back and they're worse off because they can't work with their families to create really robust programs for them. 
It's, 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 a, it's an insidious problem. I almost feel like we have to raise the entire system and start from scratch if we want it to really work. Can I just okay. uh, say, and, and I don't disagree with what Tammy is saying at all, but I, I think you need to understand that the political reality is that everybody in the state gets to vote on what we do. That's you know, unfortunate. It's not right. just, <laughs> well, yeah, maybe it is. It but should it, just be it's me. Reality. I mean, the point is it's not just we people in New York City it's true. who get to vote on it. And the people upstate and in other areas vote on the basis of their self-interest, even though we may think that it's totally an alternate reality. But that is what we have to deal with. And so Absolutely. you have to take those things into account when you try to get a policy passed statewide. That's why we have you up there arguing. That, that's why we keep, we're fighting the fight. <laughs> All right. So is there a question over there? And please identify, stand up and identify yourself. I don't think it's turned on. Is there a switch? switch? There you go. Uh, I'm Jerry Landsberg. I teach at NYU School of Social Work. Um, I just want to make a point about children. Children don't count. If you look at the issue, only one out of every five chi a ch child with a mental health problem in the United States gets care. The, the percentage of getting care in as you poor minority communities is smaller. What you want, and New York State has not done an admirable job. New York State, in fact, compared to some other states, has in fact been behind the curve. Even when they added new money, so, so to speak, to increase children's mental health services, they in fact put it so that it was done through medicating you know, programs, not for creating new innovative kinds of services. Things work, but we need to change, and we need to change the political structure. Social control for children and social control for adults is not the answer to these problems. And building prisons, as we've seen for adults, creates the problems of tomorrow. All right. Over, uh, over here. Yes. Um, my name is Susan Kirsch. I'm a retired psychiatric social worker. Actually, I worked at an Office of Mental Health outpatient clinic in downtown Brooklyn for 25 years and ran the social work student program. Um, what I found is that uh, if you empower the parents and you make them feel that they're not garbage, which often the system does, I mean, uh, the parents, I used to tell my social work students when they came from orientation, you couldn't probably live a day or a week in these parents' lives. So you have to, there's their stresses and, and their stamina for dealing with pain and difficulties is amazing. And we, we started doing like uh, groups for parents together, uh, mothers empowering mothers and fathers and making them feel that they're valuable and that they have a lot of strengths and they have a lot of caring because often they're so maligned that they just give up. The system just tells them that, you know, there's nothing good about them, nothing strong about them. And then we wound up having groups where the parents and their children came together in group sessions. I mean, you can do a lot in groups that, you know, that's not as labor intensive as individual therapy, which I believe in, but there are a lot of models out there and that community organizations could start having parent-children groups where everybody feels the tenderness of the community and not the hate. So, so I think it would really help. Um, Sylvia, can you say a couple words? One of the things you said to me when we spoke the other day is that in your program you avoid blame, you avoid blaming the parents. Um, you know, these kids have often done things, some of these kids have done things that, are, that have hurt other people. You know, how do you avoid talking about blame when you're dealing with that kind of situation? Uh, gosh, I'm trying to think really hard how not to sound like a Pollyanna. Um, the models are built around mm, really capitalizing on the strengths. So these families, the families that we work with in Blue Sky have been through programs, uh, have failed, so we, we like to say they failed 10,000 times. And a lot of that is attached to uh, what feels negative and blaming to them. So we try and it really, really do a whole inventory on their strengths and capitalize on those strengths. Um, so so it, 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 it's a really complicated answer, and it yeah. takes a lot of training around the engagement and motivation technology to understand. But fundamentally, if you start to blame people, they're just going to walk, sure, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, right, and you wind up with a whole lot of, you, you don't have the capacity to give a full dose of treatment when people walk out on you. Right, okay. Um, let's try and get some questions, not statements, <laughs> all right? Over here. Uh, yes, my name is Onaji Mawid. I'm the clinical social director of Reality House, and we use a family a base approach to a treatment uh, evidence model you called strengthening families. And at Reality House, we see that 
Uh, what's often missing from the discussion is the social justice aspect of it. Uh, if we go back to Article 13, it says slavery is abolished, slavery and involuntary survey is abolished, then it says accept, and it except in the case of a punishment of crime. So what we see is a continuation of, of uh, institutional racism and, and slavery, then it's being played out, but we're not really talking about the real problem. That's what's really what's going on. So if we look at the work of the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, we see that they were able to reduce uh, children placed in a child welfare system by 40% in Texas. Just September 21st, there was a form down at Baruch College. So my question to the panel is, are you serious about treating these children, giving them the type of respect and dignity they deserve by transforming the system, because it's not going to happen by Band-Aids. And one way to do that is to bring in the People's Institute to see how we can get those same similar results here. Are we serious about making a change, or are we just going to just talk about Band-Aid? Can I answer that? Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things and points you raise, which is why I keep bringing up the white families, um, is that, you know, when you read a probation report or you read a mental health study, that's in court or you listen to the arguments about why a kid should be placed, what you'll hear, right, is a, is a lot of weakness-based analysis, right? It's what's wrong with this family all the time, but not what's right with this family. And these families, as you know, Sylvia said, have a lot of strength in them. They've been through an awful lot. They have a lot of strength in them instead of sort of, you know, addressing the strength-based part of them and saying, you know, let's figure out what we can work with. We look at the weakness. But I will also say that, that part of the problem is in New York City, of course, in the, our poorest neighborhoods are, are filled with people of color. And so when you look at those neighborhoods and the supports they offer and the problems that exist in those neighborhoods, they seem overwhelming. And when you're a judge and you read about them in a report and you see a kid who educationally isn't doing well because those school systems are failing for them um, and families are overstressed, what we do is then we say that that kid, oops, you know, that kid needs to be out of his home. That kid needs something else instead of saying, what we should be saying, what we say with white families, which is what can we do with, with this family in this community? We give up way too easily with poor communities. And part of that you know, is political power and political base, right? They don't have the same voice. So, so we sort of have to be their voice to, to say this. Um, I, I really do believe that we have to address the disproportionate, the disproportionate minority con, uh, contact issue. That's key. Uh, these neighborhoods are policed more than other neighborhoods. That's why these kids are arrested. They're arrested for things that other kids do but don't get arrested. There was inherent unfairness to the entire system that starts from arrest. And it has a lot to do with color and poverty. And we need to really look at that because until we do, our, you know, our system's gonna be filled with black and brown kids. That's who's gonna be in there all the time. So I, you know, I think you're right about social justice as a huge part in this, in this discussion. Larry, do you see attention to disproportionality within the Department of Law? Um, I, I do. I, I think there's a couple of things that I want to want to point out. One is um, I, I agree that there's extreme disproportionality with regard to uh, the, the people who are arrested. I also um, know there's extreme disproportionality with regard to the victims. And I, you know, I've talked about there's 25 percent of the cases are assault cases, 25 percent of the cases are robbery cases. We see robberies um, with with guns on occasion. Um, we see robberies uh, with groups really beating people very badly. We see shootings. Um, we see people walking the streets with guns, including uh, increases in gang activities in some areas. Um, we, as I said, we've even seen some homicides. So I don't want to say, I, I want to um, uh, kind of make the point that it's not exactly all low-level offenses. There are some pretty significant cases that come through the system in pretty significant um, numbers. Um, but when you, we've recently been looking at this issue particularly with regard to detention. And the city, for those of you who, who may not know, undertook a pretty uh, vigorous effort to reform <coughs> detention and did it based on data uh, and essentially separated out um, kids into categories of, of risk level. Um, low, medium, and high risk level. The low risk kids were to remain in the community without any services, generally speaking. The mid-risk kids were to be put in a, in a community-based alternative to detention program. And the high risk kids, which represented 13% of the population, um, went into detention. Uh, incidentally, there was recidivism reductions um, across the board in all three categories. Um, uh, but if you look at where the disproportionality exists, um, it's not on the medium and high risk populations, it's on the low risk population. And that's why it's important to pull 
much of those cases out of the system as uh, if you can. Um, so that's why diversion is incredibly important. Um, uh, that's why we try to take a good look at what we're doing in terms of bringing that case and why we reduce the number from 77 percent of cases being filed to 60 percent. Mm -hmm. But if you look further at what's going on there, there is a lot of issues with regard to schools because the schools in many of those communities are failing the kids. There's child welfare issues. There's family functioning that needs to be improved. Um, the way I think that we could make a difference in regard to that, and, and the city has put in a grant for this for, to cover part of this, is to have instead of detention, you would have a respite care um, uh, option. But, but looking overall beyond detention, what I think we really need is to have front-loaded services. We, generally speaking, until you're pulled into the system all the way at the end, Sylvia's program is only available for kids who are at the highest end. And for example, that 11-year-old that Tammy talked about, and I, and I would dispute that that child, unless there's something I, you know, I don't know about, is going to placement. I, I, I would strongly, strongly doubt that, and I review all the placements. But <clears throat> Um, if you look at that kid, what an opportunity, right, that you could come in and assist that family with functioning, with a program. It doesn't even have to be as intensive as, as Sylvia's. It could be uh, ACS and other agencies have a variety of preventive services. If we could front load those services, instead of having to wait until the end of that case, um, I think you can make a really significant difference there. One more point in this regard, which is um, the mental health component is, is similar. Um, and there's a program called um, Quest Futures in, in Queens, and Carol Fistler, who runs the program, is here. Um, if you can front load those services up front, they don't have to be tied to the case. If you identify a need, put those services in place voluntarily. It's working in Queens. It's making a difference. It's still kind of early to get the, the, the final results. But if we could put those services in place on those cases where uh, there's, not, there's not the real strong uh, public safety concerns, but where there's real need. Um, perhaps not only could you better serve those families, but you can prevent those high-end cases from coming in in the first place. Do you see support from City Hall for more front-loading of services? Um, well, first, we put in for that grant for the respite care. Um, you know, obviously, it's a tough financial environment. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing is Quest Futures was a uh, direct outgrowth of detention reform. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think, you know, there is, there is support there. Um, I, ACS, I don't want to kind of let the cat out of the bag, <laughs> but I think they're looking at front-loading services when possible and looking at more preventive options. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's definitely something that people are aware of, are talking about, and it, the detention reform has been a pretty good model on which to base future reforms. JJI has been a good model. Esperanza has had some right. very good things that we can base it on. One of the issues on detention mm -hmm. um, is kids in foster care ending up in detention because nobody at the agency shows up when they're supposed to or, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, this was an effort by Vera Institute to create a model that then got ado adopted by ACS, I think, it was Project Reach, is it? I no, forget. Confirm. Confirm, yeah. That, um, Which has not been confirmed. <laughs> well, it was for a time, but now my no sources tell me that it's not really being enforced from within ACS, and I, I wonder, I'm sure some of the agencies are doing it and some aren't. Some of the foster care agencies are and aren't, and some aren't. To what degree, um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> to what degree are you seeing kids end up in detention because they are foster kids and there's no recourse, nobody to release them to? Well, it's less the release issue, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so yes, that happens, but often um, an attorney for the child could, or, or, or uh, the social workers in the office could work really hard to get someone in there. And in those cases, I'll be frank with you, I do complain on everyone I, that gets reported to me. I complain to Commissioner Mattingly uh, because to me that's abuse and neglect when you don't show up for your kid and that we should file petitions against them. But I, I do feel like the bigger problem is what is the resource at the end of the day, right? So maybe that kid, that foster mother will come or the group home will come. A lot of these kids are in group homes or the facility will come and they'll stand up and take the kid back. But I think that kid then starts lower on the rung in terms of getting out permanently and staying out. I think that kid absolutely has a harder hurdle because there isn't this great family resource or this great family to help them um, that can come into court and say, we're going to support you and we're going to make sure he goes to school and make sure he's in therapy. And I think that, you know, I think the courts are, are varied in terms of how 
how well they think they can trust ACS to, to work with those kids. So those crossover kids, we call them crossover kids, and on both systems, you know, th those are the, the hardest kids to keep out, and they're the hardest kids to work with because you have two systems that, quite frankly, fail them quite a bit. Well, on the flip side, it's one of the solutions, too, for the kids who don't have a family that are going to show up for them. Presumably some kind of supportive foster care system. Right, for supportive these kids. foster care, but I think yes, they do get thrown into the juvenile justice system as the right. alternative, as the right. easier right. alternative. Right. And, and the other thing is, I'm sorry, is no. that mm -hmm. ACS does not do a good job in planning for kids returning back to foster care. So they're in placement with OCFS or, uh, or a private facility and they're coming back into the community and that planning has to be much better. That planning is, is you know, is, is done. Some agencies, some, some uh, do it very well and some do it very poorly. Um, and you, that shouldn't depend, if you're a child, you shouldn't be dependent on how well your agency does it, right? You're coming back in, you should have all the services you need to come back in successfully. Right. Andrew, I would just, to follow up on that, I, yep. I would just add the respite care, I think, would be a, 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 a temporary solution mm -hmm. um, for kids not only in foster care, but whose families just can't make it in time to appear in court on behalf of that child, right. Right. Um, um, or just need a break, you know. But I think, kind of, as you suggest, the longer term solution would be more foster care for kids in that population, mm -hmm. better coordination of the foster care. Great. Over here. Hi, uh, Brian Lombrowski, Youth Involvement Specialist with the New York State Office of Mental Health, New York City Field Office. Um, I guess I'll start with a question and then go on to a statement. Is there anybody here but me who is a product of the New York State juvenile justice system and who is willing to admit it? <laughs> okay. So as to your, um, I guess, original point when you started the conversation in the panel today about their being the inability to find a young person who's willing to get up and speak about their journey through the system. I guess I'll have to be that token young person for the day. Um, wow, it's kind of an unusual spot for me to be in, but. Um, so I actually was one of those young people who was too disturbed for a residential treatment facility within OMH and actually was going to be placed in an out-of-state facility. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Kids Peace in Pennsylvania, um, but I did have a family involved. So we went to Kids Peace, did the interview, didn't like the placement, went back to the facility, that the psychiatric facility that I was in, said, eh, this isn't gonna work, and they ended up being discharged home and on two years probation and ended up being mainstreamed back into my regular high school. Um, that's all to say, one of the recommendations in your report, and I guess maybe this is a conversation for the panel to have, regarding different kinds of placements and systems working together. Um, there are a whole series of alternatives to placement. You know, in the OMH system, there's uh, Medicaid waiver, there's home-based crisis intervention, there's family-based, I mean, you know, as far as out-of-home placement, family-based treatment, community residences that are all community-based services that don't necessarily go up to that residential tr treatment facility level. And trying to figure out how can systems work better together to help, because again, our systems are fragmented. It's like you know, trying to move, from, move a young person from one system to the other system is a headache, and sometimes for a lot of people not, well, I don't wanna say not worth the effort, but you know, it, it's a challenge. To, and I understand the OMH SPOA process, the re, get, trying to get a young person to a residential treatment facility. I mean, frankly, a lot of that is designed to try to keep young people in the mental health system in the community, not necessarily thinking about how the, you know, how that affects things cross systems. Um, so I guess the question to the panel is how can we work better together to utilize the resources that are available throughout the systems to try to keep young people in the community and not necessarily even in residential treatment facilities because frankly, I don't know how much of a better place a residential treatment facility is. I mean, better, but you know, it's not, right. not necessarily ideal. Right. Good question, and thanks for speaking up. It's so well, I'd like to respond to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, first of all, I, I, I'm happy to see that, uh, that we have a product from the system and, is, and you're doing well. Uh, at any rate, uh, first we have to get all the providers 
and, and state Please. again and, and the legislature and everyone to the table to tar start talking. But again, we have to go back from a basis of appropriate treatment and placement. Because uh, recently there was the death of a group home uh, worker, her name is uh, uh, Renee Grego, that was uh, killed uh, in, in, in a private uh, group home. Uh, and that, 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 it was two young, young folks and, and, and one of them was, was uh, released from one hour more secure facilities. And then there was a shooting of a Rochester police officer uh, by a youth that was able from a private uh, residential community placement. So again, we, we have to be very uh, prudent in terms of the evaluations and, and, and placements of these young people. Again, we, we wrote a, a, a request uh, to the governor uh, uh, requesting that we be part of the DOJ uh, response. Uh, we still haven't heard anything. Hopefully today uh, we have uh, Mr. Scarborough, who's the chair of the assembly. Perhaps he could uh, make a phone call on our behalf and uh, include us in, in that uh, report. Uh, because we are the ones that are eventually going to do the job. With whatever recommendations they come forth and funding for that, those recommendations, the state workforce will have to do the work and we need to be partners in, in those recommendations. So one of the things we recommended in the report is this, is, or, or we talked a lot about, is this question, this need for some kind of greater continuum for kids with mental health issues. Um, and it's actually very hard to get information out of OMH, by the way. Um, <laughs> so I'm very glad you're here. Um, Sylvia, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between these systems and sort of how that can be smoothed? And, and so, yeah, so I'd like to talk about the, the way ACS uh, did the JGI implementation, because I think it creates a lovely way for us to look at how systems can work nicely together. And when Commissioner Mattingly was thinking about doing JGI, he brought together the law department and legal aid society and the judges and ACS and, and the, the, the actual model developers, and they sat together in working groups, ironing, ironing out as best as they could all of the issues that would prevent them from working together as partners. And then they laid out a really comprehensive goals and guidelines that all of the agencies that agreed to receive ACS money to do this agreed to follow. And then as we've gone along, we've had to report on those goals and guidelines and how they work. And, and they've been modified slightly, but I think the job that was done up front on that was just absolutely wonderful. And it's, it's enabled Larry Tammy and Leslie Abbey, who's sitting in the back as our JJ ACS person, to be able to actually meet on a regular basis and to be able to sort of do our role, spe our role specification. I know what my role is. I stand neutral. I know what Larry's position is. I know what Tammy's position is. It's been a wonderful way to actually move. And, and I would like to say that when you were talking about is there an appetite for this stuff? So when we started JJI, there was a 37% contestation rate with Corporation Council. Explain right? what that means. Uh, so Corporation Council uh, contested 37% of the cases that, that we accepted. Mm -hmm. They're ne we're now down to about a 29% contestation rate. And the judges agreed with us as often as they agreed with Corporation Council on who should come in. So there's, it, it's that partnership that, that really was forged way up front with the, with the folks who put this together that makes it a real, a real marvelous possibility. And what, they, what they've allowed Blue Sky to be able to do is so we, we, we offer a continuum of services right up to foster care. Um, and the judges have agreed to allow the clinicians in Blue Sky to make the decisions of what kids go where. So it's helped with judges sort of, and, and, and you know, I only mean this in the most respectful way, but it's helped, helped judges to also hold on to what their position is and to recognize they're not clinicians, that they're judges looking at, at public safety. So it's created a nice way for us all to work together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, if I can, uh, respond somewhat to the gentleman's question. Uh, I think that is probably one of the biggest conundrums that uh, is, exists right now. And I know Commissioner Carrion has been very frustrated in not being able to get that kind of uh, cross systems uh, assistance because agencies tend to look at this as a, an OCF problem, a juvenile justice problem instead of looking at it as a problem, perhaps including the mental health system or including uh, SED and their other uh, agencies. 
I think, and I, you know, I don't want to put too much um, uh, stock or too much faith in this report, but I think this report is going to be a big stick to force those kind of, of uh, collaborations because in order to reform this, it's going to have to take the cooperation of the, the executive branch and all of the systems. And if you can do that, you can start to resolve some of the problems that we've been talking about here, which is, you know, you can stop some of these low level uh, or low risk incidents from going into the facilities for, for truancy or for, for uh, petty larceny and things like that if you can provide other services for them. So hopefully uh, this will be one of the things that, that could uh, start that, that in, in motion. Larry. Um, I, I would just add, I, I, you mentioned a continuum, and I think it's a good way of thinking about this because the, the types of um, mental health issues we see kind of fall along a range. Um, I, I think it probably would look something like uh, on the high end, we still are going to need residential treatment facilities, yeah. and we still have to, um, that process, it seems to me, needs to loosen up, but we also need, it's very, very cumbersome to pull all this information together, and sometimes it doesn't exist, so we need to kind of work on how we can better advocate for, um, uh, for the young people that, that need that intervention. Um, second would be um, uh, kids that are placement bound in the OCFS system, system but need mental health services. They, something has to be done to, to fix that. That's, that's something I think, obviously, hopefully, will come out of um, uh, the reform efforts that Commissioner Carrion is behind. Um, third would be kids with mental health problems who can be maintained in the community, like through um, Sylvia's program or through other similar programs. Fourth would be uh, probation-bound kids that don't necessarily need um, the same level of intervention um, uh, as JJI, which is quite intense, but could use um, mental health services in the family, and particularly ones that go to the family and that work with the family in the home, um, rather than having the kid come to the facility. Um, fifth, I think, would be mental health um, services independent of the case, kind of the Quest Futures model that I talked about. Um, the Department of Juvenile Justice had a program called the Collaborative Family Initiative that um, uh, was functioning and then lost their funding and is now reconstituting, I believe, uh, in the coming months. And then I guess the other group that I think is important to talk about is um, um, dual diagnoses kids who have um, both um, substance abuse issues and mental health issues and there's a lack of services with regard to that group. And I guess the way to do it is start in, in, in many ways the way that Sylvia talked about and start picking off these things one at a time. Okay. Uh, Anstis. Um, hi, I'm Anstis Agnew, Forestdale. It's nice to see um, William Scarborough, a great friend of um, Forestdale and Queens. And it's nice to see Queens represented. This is not my area of expertise, but I can tell you how it affects me running a foster care agency. Um, the kids come up in the system and they get fingerprinted. And we can't get jobs for them when they're aging out of foster care. And um, I have been told by the airline industry by the hospital industry, by any major industry in Queens, that if they have a record, they cannot get a job. So I think un until we address this, um, we're gonna be struggling with a very angry adult population. And I'm wondering, um, William, Bill, mm -hmm. if you have any um, thoughts about uh, wiping the slate clean and what we can do. Um, I even have people interviewing to be foster parents, great people. They go through the training, they get fingerprinted, they're felons. Can I Can't just make, I just want to make a distinction between JOs and JDs because JDs records are sealed, JOs are not necessarily. So I don't know what the age of the kids you're talking, they're older, they're aging out. I don't know when their arrest occurred or their conviction occurred, but that would be a difference because, I mean, look, I think sealing in general is a little bit of a fiction. Um, because things don't always get sealed. So when we have a client who's 18 and gets arrested in the adult system, his juvenile record is often on his rap sheet um, for everyone to see, which it shouldn't be. So uh, are you referring, I'm assuming you're referring to the older kids yes, who you're I, trying to age yes. out. Um, Mr. Scarborough. Yes. Well, um, you talk about political will. And to be honest with you, I don't know that there's a political will uh, to just wipe the records out. Um, because there, you know, you get a lot of pushback on the other side about coddling and so on and so forth, and that, that's just a fact. I think what we need to do 
is we need to make more of an effort to identify uh, employers or other providers that are willing to, to um, work with these children, you know, or at, at that age, even given the circumstances that they come out of. And I, I know it's not easy, but I think that's the only way we can go is uh, to, to try to educate people about the, the circumstances. And, you know, it's difficult in this environment because we have no money, um, but ideally, you know, people respond to financial incentives. And maybe we need to start looking at some ways to create financial incentives uh, for employers and others to take a chance on, on, on these young people. You know, I also want to well, say like that to, that's, uh, that's an issue with, um, with the findings in the first place that you should consider, right? So it's, it's you know, I, I can understand why you, you know, maybe if you're not in the system, you think, so he's got a petty larceny finding, or he's got a assault three finding, or an attempted assault two finding. Those findings do haunt, they do haunt kids. They haunt them in the, in the criminal justice system, but they also haunt them afterwards. So findings are very important. And again, it's gonna be disproportionate, right? So the yes. people that aren't getting jobs, aren't able to get employed, are gonna be those same kids as adults. So. The, the actual finding is important that, I'm sorry, finding is when you're found guilty or innocent. It's the trial part of a right. family court. They make it sound pretty and make it a finding um, as opposed to a trial, but it's really the same thing. So there's a conviction basically, and that conviction does stick. It, sometimes it's not supposed to stick, and, and sometimes it is, and, and it does, and it really harms the future. And it could be for things like school fights. It could be for things that, you know, stealing a car, which, yeah. You know, when you're 15, should not haunt you for the rest of your life. When you're 16, should not haunt you for the rest of your life. So, yeah, but just also, I, I like to add, add add something which that that folks need to consider. You have to look at the district attorney's office. They have they, they have a, a decision to make when that when that docket hits the uh, the family court system, and the decision is whether to go forward with a JD petition, a juvenile delinquent petition, and prosecute the youngster under those uh, under that arena. Or they make an election to push it to Supreme Court, where if it's convicted, he gets the J.O. So you have right. to look at those numbers and why is it that Johnny is getting uh, uh, J.D. and Tyrone perhaps may be getting the J.O. So you have to look at that right. and, 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 and balance that out and then come up with your own conclusion. But you have to lobby that, that particular county. So we're right at our time limit here. I want to point out... All right. One more question to ask. It's got a quick answer across the board, but before I do that, I want to point out Clara Hemphill and Kendra Hurley who did the heavy lifting on this report, so thanks to them. Um, I also, I just wanted to ask each of you one word answer. Are you hopeful or, well, two words possibly, not hopeful that this um, Justice Department um, investigation is gonna lead to dramatic change in the system? Yes or no? Hopeful or not? I'm, I'm hopeful. Well, I think with uh, Pet, <laughs> PEF's involvement, involvement uh, it'll be a success, if and only if PEF comes to the table with, uh, with our partners. Okay. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, but not exclusively or just because of the Justice Department report. Okay. <laughs> I'm hopeful because you can't continue to do this work unless you remain hopeful. I'm always hopeful. <laughs> Great. All right. Thanks very much for those of you um, who have joined us. Thanks very much to the panel. See you next time.